Welcome to section one of Microbiology Fundamentals. In this section, we'll be discussing bacterial structures. So let's get started. We will cover all the information in this table, but don't be overwhelmed by this information because we'll go through each item one by one. And by the end of the lecture, you will have these details and how to apply them down solid. So let's start with the top row cytoplasmic membranes. All bacteria have a cytoplasmic membrane. And just like in human cells, this is a phospholipid bilayer. In gram-positive bacteria, there's lipotechoic acids. Really the only thing you need to know about these is that they can trigger a host immune response, leading to the release of cytokines such as TNF-alpha or interleukin-1. And lastly, this is the location of penicillin binding proteins, which is the target of penicillin antibiotics. Now here's a depiction of gram-positive bacteria. Notice we have the cytoplasmic membrane right here. And you can see that it's made of phospholipids. And also you can see the lipotechoic acid right here, which originates in the cytoplasmic membrane. And this image depicts gram-negative bacteria. And it has that cytoplasmic membrane made of phospholipids as well. Now superficial to the cytoplasmic membrane is the cell wall. The cell wall is made of peptidoglycans and it gives the cell rigidity and structural support. And the cell wall is thick in gram-positive bacteria. In fact, during gram staining, crystal violet will bind to the thick cell wall and give the bacterium this blue appearance. In gram-negative bacteria, the cell wall is thin. That means that gram-negative bacteria don't bind that crystal violet and don't turn blue. So looking at the gram-positive bacteria, we can see that this cell wall is very thick. Whereas in gram-negative bacteria, the cell wall is very thin. Going back to our table now, it's important to recognize that the cell wall is actually absent in mycoplasma species. This is strange because the cell wall is responsible for rigidity and support of the cell. So how do mycoplasma species survive without it? Well, they have sterols, and those are embedded in their cytoplasmic membrane, and they give it that stability that it needs. Now here's a figure depicting mycoplasma. We can see it has that cytoplasmic membrane, and within it, we can see these sterols. These give the cell the stability it needs. And since mycoplasma species require sterols to live, you can really only culture them using Eaton's auger, which provides those sterols. So if you want to culture mycoplasma species, you need Eaton's auger. The last detail about the cell wall that you need to know is that mycobacteria species, such as mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycobacterium leprae, contain mycolic acids. Now this figure depicts mycobacteria. As normal, it has a cytoplasmic membrane, then it has a cell wall that's thin, much like gram-negative bacteria, and attached to this thin cell wall are these mycolic acids. So you can picture these being so close together that they're kind of attached. But the important thing that you need to know is that opposite of these mycolic acids are these outer lipids, which are much more reminiscent of the phospholipids. In any case, it's these mycolic acids that bind the acid fast stain for mycobacteria. This is an acid fast stain of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Notice that the organisms appear bright red after the binding of mycolic acids. Now let's talk about the flagellum and the pilus together. Another name for pilus is fimbria. Those terms are interchangeable. In plural, it would be pili and fimbriae. Now the bacteria that have flagella use this for motility, and the bacteria that have pili use them to bind to host cells and this allows for an infection. However, there's other pili that allow bacteria to bacteria binding, and this is used during conjugation, a way to exchange genetic information between bacteria. This topic will be discussed in more detail in bacterial genetics, which is section three. From this gram-positive figure, you can see the flagellum right here. It extends from the cytoplasmic membrane down here all the way out to the environment surrounding the cell. And you can also see a pilus right here, extending from the cell wall out to the environment. Looking at our gram-negative image, we can see the same thing. We have the flagellum and the pilus. Now let's talk about the glycocalyx. This is simply a network of polysaccharides, and it can come in two forms. If the glycocalyx is disorganized and only loosely attached to the cell wall, it is termed a slime layer. On the other hand, if the glycocalyx is organized and firmly attached to the cell wall, it's termed a capsule. A slime layer will create a biofilm on prosthetics. For example, Staph epidermidis is known for creating a biofilm on prosthetic devices, such as artificial hip joints. And a capsule serves to protect the bacteria from phagocytosis. It's also important to know that vaccines often target this capsule. Looking at the gram-positive image, we can see the glycocalyx right here. It's the most superficial portion of this gram-positive bacteria. And once again, this could be a slime layer or a capsule. Looking at the gram-negative bacteria, we can see that same glycocalyx. 
Before we mentioned that the glycocalyx is simply a network of polysaccharides, which is true. However, there's one exception to this. It's the capsule of bacillus and thoracis. This isn't polysaccharides, it's actually a protein network of proteins called poly-D glutamate. But otherwise, just assume that the glycocalyx is a network of polysaccharides. Next, let's discuss the outer membrane. This is only present in gram-negative bacteria. And during the gram staining process, after the blue staining with the crystal violet is washed away, which we talked about up here, then a counter stain is applied. This counter stain is called safranin. And this safranin will bind to the outer membrane and give the cell that red appearance. That's why gram negative bacteria appear red, whereas gram positive bacteria appear blue or purple. Another important detail about the outer membrane is that it contains porins. These allow the transfer of nutrients. Perhaps the most important part of the outer membrane are the lipopolysaccharides or LPS. These are embedded throughout the outer membrane, and the lipopolysaccharides have three components, lipid A, a core polysaccharide, and the O antigen. However, only one of these components, lipid A, is actually important. And the reason lipid A is so important is because it stimulates the host immune response, and it causes a profound release of cytokines such as TNF and IL-1, and these lead to fever, shock, and diarrhea. This is called septic shock. And septic shock is discussed in more detail in the next section when we discuss virulence. So again, looking at gram-negative bacteria, we have the outer membrane, and we have this entire lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, the most important part of which is lipid A. And when the bacteria dies, then this outer membrane will release this lipopolysaccharide, and then lipid A will induce the release of lots of cytokines, which leads to shock. And then right here, we can see the porins, which is another part of the outer membrane. Next, let's discuss the periplasm. The periplasm is located between the outer membrane and the cytoplasmic membrane in gram-negative bacteria. What you need to know about this area is that it contains hydrolytic enzymes. For example, things like beta-lactamases. As a side note, gram-positive organisms don't have a periplasm because they don't have this outer membrane. However, gram-positive organisms still have beta-lactamases. They're just excreted, so they go into the extracellular environment. So gram-positive organisms will excrete the beta-lactamases into the extracellular environment instead of keeping them in this periplasm. Looking at the gram-negative bacteria, we can see the cytoplasmic membrane here, and the outer membrane here, and the periplasm is the space between the two. And once again, this space contains beta-lactamases. Once again, gram-positive organisms don't have an outer membrane, so they don't have a periplasm, and their beta-lactamases are excreted, which you can see here. Lastly, let's discuss endospores. An endospore can be considered a layer that is formed during a dormant state. It allows the bacteria to resist heat, chemicals, dehydration, and starvation. Ultimately, it allows the bacteria to survive until the environment is safe enough for the bacteria to become metabolically active again. There's only two relevant groups that create endospores, and they're both gram-positive. These are the clustered Iridium species and the bacillus species. As a side note, you're going to hear the term spore in other contexts. For example, Coxiella burnetti is a gram-negative organism that forms a spore-like structure to help it survive unfavorable conditions. However, this is not an endospore. Also, fungi will produce spores as part of their asexual life cycle. But this use of the word spore is very different from the endospores we're discussing here. With that understanding, let's dive in and discuss the structure of endospores. Starting at the center where there's DNA, an endospore will contain dipocholinic acid, or DPA. Surrounding that is the cytoplasmic membrane, like you'd expect with typical bacteria. And this is called the spore core. Surrounding that is a peptidoglycan wall, just like the cell wall you'd typically expect. And this wall is called the spore cortex. Outside that is an additional cytoplasmic membrane, and then a keratin-like protein wall, which is called the spore coat. And then most superficial is the exosporium. However, this exosporium is present only in Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus cereus species. And this image depicts the endospore. In the center, we have the DNA and the dipocholinic acid, which you can see listed here. The purpose of this is to help keep the spore dehydrated. Outside of that is the spore core, which, as we mentioned before, is just a cytoplasmic membrane, as you'd expect normally. Beyond that is the spore cortex. This is just a peptoglycan wall, just like the cell wall you'd expect to see in a metabolically active bacteria. Outside of that is an additional cytoplasmic membrane. Then there's the spore coat, which is just another thick wall, much like the spore cortex, except it's not made of peptidoglycan, it's made of a keratin-like protein. And then the most superficial part of the endospore is the exosporium. This interacts with the environment, but it's only present in bacillus. Recall the two groups that produce endospores. Those are bacillus species and clostridium species. But just know that clostridium species do not form this exosporium. 
So now we've covered everything in the table. And before we do a review question, there's just one item left to discuss. And these are polymerases. Now bacteria have DNA polymerases, and this is just used for replication, i.e. making more DNA. They also have RNA polymerases. This is used for transcription or to make mRNA. So DNA polymerases make more DNA and RNA polymerases make more RNA. But why is it important to remember their respective roles? Well, it's important that DNA polymerases don't make mistakes in the DNA it creates because those mistakes would be passed on to the progeny and possibly harm them. After all, the DNA polymerase is responsible for replication, so you don't want it to be making a bunch of mistakes. Whereas RNA polymerases might make mistakes in their creation of mRNA, but those mistakes won't mess up all the progeny of the bacteria. At most, these mistakes will just make that particular bacterium less virulent. And now that we've covered all the bacterial structures you need to know for step one, let's review with the question. A researcher is attempting to create a novel staining agent that will only bind to certain bacterial species. This species cannot form an endospore, it does not contain mycolic acids, and contains only one phospholipid bilayer. Which of the following does the organism described most likely possess? A. A cytokine inducing structure in the outer membrane. B. A layer that tightly binds to the saffron and counter stain. C. A protein structure allowing for motility. Or D. A relatively thin layer of peptidoglycan. Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this species is a gram-positive bacteria. We know this because it has only one phospholipid bilayer. Going back to our gram-negative and gram-positive images, we see that gram-negative bacteria have two phospholipid bilayers, the outer membrane and that cytoplasmic membrane. But when you look at the gram-positive image, you can see that it doesn't have that outer membrane. And there's one detail that's not super useful, and it's that it cannot form an endospore. This doesn't tell us what exactly this organism is. The value of this statement is just to tell us that it's not a clostridium or a bacillus species. In any case, Knowing we are dealing with a gram-positive organism, which structure might be present in the bacteria the researcher is studying? The correct answer is choice C, a protein structure allowing for motility. This, of course, is describing a flagellum. And flagella are not unique to gram-positive or gram-negative organisms, so this bacteria in the question stem may possess this structure. Now, choice A is wrong because this refers to lipopolysaccharides. You might have been thinking about the lipotechoic acid in the inner cytoplasmic membrane of gram-positive organisms, and those do induce the release of cytokines. However, we know that only gram-negative bacteria contain that outer membrane. So the cytokine-inducing structure here describes the lipopolysaccharide. Now choice B is wrong because this describes the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, which will stain red with that counterstain with safranin. Lastly, choice D is wrong because this describes a thin cell wall common to gram-negative bacteria and mycobacteria. However, we know we're not dealing with mycobacterium because this organism does not have mycolic acids. So again, the correct answer is choice C. And that concludes this section.